Good evening. Hello, and welcome to the Westmead Institute for Medical Researchers final Meet the Researcher Seminar for 2020. My name is Katrina Dowling, and I am the CEO of the Wimmer Foundation. It's really wonderful to have you all join us this evening. The Wimmer Foundation is focused on generating philanthropic funding to support medical research conducted at the Westmead Institute for Medical Research. I really do know how busy it can be at this time of year, so I truly thank you for logging in, and I hope you find tonight's session really very informative. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to the land on which we gather remotely today. We pay our respect to their elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. As you know, our focus this evening is melanoma. With global temperatures on the rise and Australia regrettably having the highest incidence rate of, of melanoma in the world with 14,000 Australians and uh, diagnosed annually and one Australian passing every five hours due to melanoma, it's really critical that we take time to better understand melanoma, the risk factors, the warning signs, and the options available for diagnosis, treatment, and most importantly, prevention. Tonight, we'll hear from two of Australia's leading experts in this space, Professor Pablo Fernandez Penas and Professor Anne Cust. We're also very grateful to have Linda Seaman join us. Linda has graciously agreed to share with us her very personal experience with melanoma after first being diagnosed at the very scary age of 12 years old. So some quick housekeeping before we get underway. For the next hour, you'll be unable to access your microphone and camera. I would encourage you to ask questions, uh, but please, if you, if you would like to, do that via the chat function. And both Pablo and Anne will do their very best to answer as many questions as possible. So before I pass over to our experts, I'd love to take this opportunity to just give you a little bit of a brief about WIMA and the broader Westmead Health Precinct. The Westmead Institute for Medical Research, or WIMA, as we refer to ourselves, is a leading Australian medical research institute investigating some of the most serious illnesses and diseases affecting Australians and global populations. WIMA research is really innovative and it's impactful. Uh, and one of the key things that makes WIMA so strong in terms of its research capabilities and impact is that it's a truly multidisciplinary research institute. So we're based around five key research themes, these being infection and immunity, liver and metabolic, neuroscience and vision, cardiorespiratory, and of course, cancer. And the multidisciplinary nature of WIMA means that researchers are really, really well placed to investigate the interrelated causes and treatments applicable to serious illnesses. Research is focused on finding better ways to prevent, treat, and in some instances, cure serious illnesses. So that's resulting uh, in positive health outcomes for current and future generations, for our children and our grandchildren, which I think is a fabulous thing. So our vision is to liberate people throughout the world from the burden of serious illness. And we, of course, are based in Westmead, part of the thriving Westmead Health Precinct. And the Westmead Health Precinct is fast developing to become the leading health, education, research and training precinct in Australia. It's really central to the development of, of, of Western Sydney. And if current development plans go according to plan, by 2036, uh, the health precinct will account for 50,000 jobs. So I think that's really fabulous in terms of the creation of, of, of smart jobs in, in Western Sydney. So there are over 450 researchers that collectively come together to form WIMA. And these researchers range from PhD students right through to very experienced and internationally renowned researchers, some of whom you'll hear from tonight. And many women researchers are active practicing clinicians. So this means that they share their time across both women in terms of active research and uh, at the Westmead Hospital. And this means that our research is immediately applied in the treatment of patients. 
And the issues that researcher clinicians are observing day in, day out, are of course used in um, informing our research projects and our key questions under investigation. So we call this approach uh, translational research. And what it really means is that we're able to transform patient care. It's highly practical and it's very applied research. So uh, we champion life-changing medical research through personal connection. And it's this bedside to bench to bedside approach that, as I said, truly transforms lives of everyday Australians and people around the world. So our focus this evening is on melanoma. Uh, and melanoma research is conducted within our Centre for Cancer Research. And the Centre for Cancer Research is working towards a world in which cancer becomes far less prevalent and where cancers are more effectively treated. And I think that's truly wonderful. I think we all would know somebody who's been significantly impacted by, by cancer. Uh, and so I think that that really is a fabulous mission for the Centre for Cancer Research to be working toward. The Centre's research uh, is informed in many instances based around what we call the concept of precision or personalised medicine. Uh, and, and this really involves um, you know, looking at, a, at an individual's genetic profile and coming up with very tailored treatment. And in terms of our focus on cancer, we stretch across breast cancer, gynaecological cancers, blood and liver cancers, and of course, skin cancers, including melanoma. So tonight, we're fortunate, very fortunate to be joined by two experts from our Centre for Cancer Research. Professor Fernandez Panyas is the lead of Women's Melanoma and Skin Cancer Research Group, a professor of dermatology at the University of Sydney, and Head of Dermatology at Westmead Hospital. He's also Director of the Centre for Translational Skin Research and New South Wales Lead of the ACRF Australia Centre of Excellence in Melanoma Imaging and Diagnosis. What do you do in your spare time, Pablo? <laughs> um, professor Cust is a Professor of Cancer Epidemiology and key collaborator within the Melanoma and Skin Cancer Research Group and a Career Development Fellow of the National Health and Medical Research Council. And Anne also holds leadership positions within the University of Sydney's School of Public Health and in international consortia, including the Genes Environment and Melanoma Steering Group and the Genetics of Melanoma Consortium Analysis Team. If I were to read you their full resumes, we'd probably take up our full hour. Uh, so I won't do that. I will um, just cut to the chase. And Anne, I'd like to, to hand to you. Thank you very much, Katrina. Can you hear me okay? We can. Great. Thank you everyone who's joined us this evening. So let me introduce melanoma to you. Melanoma is a type of cancer that develops in the skin's pigment cells called melanocytes. Melanocytes produce melanin to help protect the skin from ultraviolet radiation, which we find in sunlight. And when these melanocytes cluster, they can form a mole. So most people have moles, uh, most mole, and most moles are quite safe. But sometimes uh, the melanocytes can grow and divide in an uncontrolled way. And it's, it's then that a melanoma can form. So, as Katrina said, Australia has the highest rate of melanoma in the world, with around 14,000 uh, Australians diagnosed with an invasive melanoma each year. Uh, but actually, another 23,000 Australians diagnosed with a melanoma in situ, which is an early form of melanoma. And on top of that, uh, about two thirds of all Australians will develop some form of skin cancer in their lifetime. So skin cancer is a really big issue in Australia. Uh, so invasive melanoma is actually the third most common cancer for both men and women in Australia behind breast cancer and prostate cancer. And it's one of the most common cancers affecting young Australians. And so these, some of the, these risk factors shown on the screen speak to why we have such high rates. Uh, without a doubt, the, 
the greatest preventable, preventable cause of melanoma is overexposure to ultraviolet radiation. Uh, usually this radiation is from the sun, but you could also get it from uh, solarium uh, tanning machines, which are of course uh, now banned in Australia for their commercial use. And actually some of the earlier research we did was looking at the at sunbeds and how they, um, what their association with melanoma was. And we found that people who developed melanoma under the age of 30 and who had used a sunbed, uh, about three quarters of their melanomas were due to sunbed use. And this research that we did, that Wimmer was part of, uh, helped, helped with the banning of sunbeds uh, in Australia. So you can see the type of impact that uh, that this research can have. But there's other risk factors that you can see on the screen, uh, fair hair uh, or fair skin, um, red hair or blonde hair, uh, high mole counts and um, different types of patterns of sun exposure. So particularly if you get sunburnt or if you have uh, very high uh, intensity, uh, so sun, sunlight. So if you're exposed to UV in the middle of the day, um, those really intense bouts of sun exposure are a strong risk factor for melanoma. So we also know that genetic risk factors uh, are a common uh, cause of melanoma. So obviously family history, um, but we can dig down into, uh, into families and look at the genes that might be involved in uh, the development of melanoma in their family. And this on the screen is showing um, a new risk prediction model that we've created called FRAME. And it's for predicting the risk of having a high risk gene variant in a gene called CDKN2A, which is a, a tumor suppressor gene. And it's associated with, um, particularly with families that have very strong uh, a very strong risk factor, uh, a very strong, uh, lots of cases of melanoma in the family. So it, it, it's especially common in families that have uh, people who develop melanoma at an early age or who have lots of family members with melanoma, or sometimes it's reflected in um, people can develop multiple primary melanomas. So these are indicators that someone might have a high risk uh, variant in the CDKN2A gene and uh, this, this uh, risk model can help uh, predict that and work out if someone should be directed to genetic counselling to help, to, to help work out if they should get tested for this gene variant. So if you do carry this gene variant, your lifetime risk of getting a melanoma is about 50%. And we know from our research that people at high risk of melanoma have better outcomes if they're identified early and then managed in a high risk clinic. So if they're coming for six monthly appointments, having photography done and then, um, you know, close surveillance, we've shown that it results in better outcomes for the patients and, uh, and lower costs for the health service. So uh, this is all research that we've done through WIMA and this, uh, risk model will be up on a, on a website soon so people can access it um, from the public. So just a little bit more about the epidemiology of melanoma. Um, actually in Australia, up until about the age of 45, uh, men and women, ha women have similar rates of melanoma, but after the age of 45, it's actually much more common in men than women. And that probably reflects uh, behaviours of um, people spending time in the sun and the types of sun protection behaviours that are perhaps more common among women than men, uh, particular, you know, after, uh, after the, the, the 20s when everyone thinks they're uh, invincible, <laughs> uh, women tend to have better sun protection behaviours than men in, in older adult, adulthood. Uh, but also women, uh, women are more likely to get melanoma on the legs, for example, uh, and men are more likely to get their melanomas on the torso. So 
uh, definitely the types of some behaviours do uh, are reflected in how melanoma appears. And while most melanomas appear on areas of the body that do get exposed to sunlight, it is important to know that they can form in parts of the body that don't uh, typically get exposed to the sun. So it is important to, uh, to just be aware that they can develop anywhere. And if you notice a change in your skin, then to make sure you get it checked out. And I'm now gonna hand over to Pablo, who's gonna walk us through uh, some of the signs to look out for and to describe a bit more of the research that we're doing. Thank you, Anne. Let's see if we can go to the next slide. And this is what we see, what my colleagues and myself, when we're looking at patients, we try to diagnose as early as possible and remove as early as, early as possible. So we we don't have bad outcomes in our patients. And, and to recognize a melanoma that you have here in the photo, and probably many of you have seen in some other photos, we use this acronym that we think in Australia, everybody should learn. That is the first few letters of the alphabet, the A, B, C, D, E. And I'm gonna review a little bit this with you. And we look at asymmetry, and asymmetry in this lesion, what it means is that if you try to get a line through the lesion and fold the lesion in two, you can find that this deletion is symmetric. So asymmetry is a bad sign. Then we look at the border. We, we love borders that are continuous, like on this side of the photo. But if you look, keep looking at the lesion, this is like an island. We don't like those. We like round things. They're beautiful. Things that are not round, they're not that beautiful on the skin. So irregular border is another fact. Color. Most lesions, they're gonna be just one color. We like homogeneous color, maybe a little bit darker in the center and melting a little bit with the normal skin on the sides. What is not a good sign is that you have different colors, darker, like in this area of the, this lesion, lighter in this other part, a little bit darker again here. Sometimes we can see white, we can see blue. Those colors, they're colors that we don't like. So multiple colors is the next, the next aspect of the lesion that we look. And then diameter. It's true that you could have melanomas that are very small, two millimeters or three millimeters, but the risk of those lesions to create problems in the long term if they're very, is very small. Lesions that are at least six millimeters, and that's what we measure, as soon as they're six millimeters, if they have any of the asymmetry, border and color, those lesions, they need to be reviewed because they have a chance of being a melanoma. And the earliest that we can remove a melanoma from the skin, less chances of having a bad prognosis. But sometimes lesions, they look okay. And the only problem that we have is that they change with time. So this is the evolution. So it's good to have, if you've got multiple moles, to have a good review, I will say with the best expert that you can find, a dermatologist, but I understand that sometimes it's not that easy. A good GP that is has interest in pigmented lesion, have a good baseline check, and then look at moles from time to time. You can do it in front of a mirror. And if any of them they change, then it's when is it a good time to go and find that clinician that is going to help you, that dermatologist, to confirm if that could be a malignancy or not, and then get appropriate treatment. And why is this thing about looking at this lesion as soon as possible? We classify, like any cancer, melanoma in different stages. Stage zero will be this melanoma in situ. The chances of survival is 100%, so most people, they will be aligned just straight on the top. But as the melanoma, they get thicker, or they go to the lymph nodes, or they go to other organs, chances of survival, they decrease with time, with years. And this is what this graph is showing. When a melanoma is just one millimeter thick, that's what we call a stage one, then in 10 years, there's a 5% of the, the patients that they're, gonna, they're not gonna survive. So we want to avoid this. But if the melanoma is thicker than one millimeter, so we're getting in a stage two, those, the prognosis is even worse. If the melanoma at the time of the diagnosis has already gone to the lymph nodes, this is a stage three, and if it has gone to any other organ, will be a stage four. The good news is that this data that you're showing, you're seeing in this graph was just before the new amazing treatments that we have in 
in, for melanoma, these immunotherapies. And although if you look at this graph, patients with a stage four melanoma, 50% of the patients were already dead by one year. Now we've got long-term survivors with more than 50% alive after five years. So this graph needs to be reviewed, would be improved once we have the effect of, of the new therapies. But certainly, still in five years, 50% of the people that they have a stage four melanoma, they're gonna die from melanoma. And that's the intention of our group, to try to decrease the number of people that they go and reach a stage four melanoma. And if it's possible to treat all the patients in, with melanoma and get uh, good responses. And at this stage, I think that we can stop science. And as you have heard, we've got a, a patient, Linda, that, that had melanoma when she was 12 and then had a bumpy road with all things melanoma. And she's been involved in research in Wimmer, research at the Melanoma Institute of Australia, participating in, in our activities. And we're so glad that she has decided to come and share her experience with us. Thank you, Linda. Thank you, Pablo. Um, yeah, I guess I don't know how much you want me to share. I've had um, two primary melanomas. Um, the first one when I was 12 and the second one was a long time afterwards when I was 29 and it was in my scalp. Um, so it went undetected because it was in my head. Yeah, so um, the early detection, if it had been detected, I would have been fine. But since then, um, I've had about seven years of um, surgeries on my neck with um, secondary melanomas, um, but I am out now out of the woods there. I've had some immunotherapy and that's made the biggest difference for my life. So, um, yeah. Did you know at the beginning the signs of melanoma? Did people tell you about the risk? It was something in the family that you knew? Uh, yes, we had. We always had um, suspicions. My mum had had three melanomas and my uncle had had quite a serious melanoma and he's since had another two. I think we're all in your high risk clinic now. <laughs> and um, since then, my cousin as well. So there was definitely, this was in the early days, we just felt there was some kind of family history. So my mum was always very careful with me and the son. But of course, growing up in the 70s and 80s, we didn't have rash shirts and the sunscreen was pretty limited too. So um, to look out for, yes, look out for changing moles, um, definitely. And I was going to the melanoma unit um, from when I was 20, I think. Linda, um, thank you for, for, for sharing that insight. Um, I'd like to just ask, you know, how has melanoma changed your life? What have you had to do to, to, to I guess, adapt um, to, to yeah. dealing with, with melanoma as a, as a big risk factor for you? I guess because my first one was when I was so young and in high school, I was um, very careful uh, but still did sometimes get sunburn. Um, I would get caught out, but mostly I have been really careful. Um, and especially with my children, I when they're younger, it's much easier to keep rash shirts on them, sunscreen hats, you know, staying out of the sun in the middle of the day when possible. Um, and also educating others around me. We have a lot of people who don't wear sunscreen or have very odd looking moles. So I'm always saying, if you had that checked, have, is yes. it? and I always make sure, make sure it's a dermatologist. Um, well, you know, that's just my mm -hmm. personal thing. And I've heard some, you know, mm -hmm. some stories of things that have gotten missed with others, with GPs and stuff. But I guess the GP is always the first good first start. But um, I do always encourage friends to get their skin checked regularly. And of course, to be putting sunscreen on and hats. Yeah, great. And, and, and there has been, you know, a number of, of, of um, sun awareness campaigns um, over, over the years um, to try and educate people. But despite that, we're seeing that, you know, particularly in younger populations today, um, you know, there, 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 is, um, there is decreasing levels of, of, of um, 
you know, change in, change in behaviour, which I think is a really worrying thing. So if you had one message, you know, to, to, to send out there, particularly to, to, to younger um, Australians, what, what would that message be? I think um, your campaign or the campaign they had of the young people who have died from melanoma was uh, that really hit home for me. And I know for my kids, um, I kind of tried to, to shelter them from how serious mine was until I knew I was okay. But um, that advertising campaign with um, Wes, I think it was, who passed away at such a young age, I think that's where it might sit them back and go, oh, okay, this, this could happen to me. Um, I do struggle with my own teenage children, I have to say, and they know all about melanoma. They've had moles cut off, and yet it, it's still a battle every day. Have you got your sunscreen on? Have, are you taking a rash yet? Have you got a hat? So um, it's a peer pressure thing, I think. So, or not peer pressure, but whatever your peers are doing, if they're in bikinis and whatnot, that's... So I think we need to get those trendy, um, those kind of wetsuit swimming cozies for the girls at the moment with the long sleeve rash tops. They look fantastic. And if you get more of the surfy girls wearing them, you might get more of just the girls in the general population wanting to wear them and look like, you know, they're surfing idols. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a really great point and a great, great suggestion. And I think, you know, we do have a long way to go um, still in terms of changing perceptions of, you know, a tan being healthy and, 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 and trendy to have. So, um, but yeah, I think that, great, that is a great suggestion around, around um, more acceptance and, and uptake of, of rash suits. So um, look, thank you, Linda. Um, it's really fabulous that, that you've made the time to, to share your story with us. We truly, truly appreciate it. Um, fortunately, you. melanoma is preventable as Pablo said, if detected early and it's treatable too. So to better protect Australians, it's critical that we continue to develop our diagnostics um, and treatment capabilities and that we also focus on our prevention efforts as we were just discussing, like the SunSafe campaigns that we've seen um, to date. So Pablo, I understand that you're managing the rollout of groundbreaking imaging technology across New South Wales. Can you tell us a little bit about that and, and, and what that involves? This is a very exciting project and we're so glad to be involved in, in, in it. It's a, a consortium that we arranged between the University of Queensland, Monash University in Victoria and Sydney University and what we're doing is we got a grant, an infrastructure grant. So that means that we're going to get equipment. And it's the equipment that is here on the photo. It's a full body photography system that creates an avatar, a 3D body that shows all the lesions and will help us to classify, like you're seeing in this, in this picture here, all the moles of the patient. And then we can follow those and see what is happening. So the, the amazing part of the project is that we are going to put five of these devices. Three of them are going to be in Metropolitan in, in Sydney, but we want to put two of them in rural and remote New South Wales to help people that they have moles or they have lesions and that they don't have the close dermatologist to review them. And we are going to in prepare teledermatology and telemedicine systems. And the whole idea of the research, and, and that's the part that is the, the amazing part of, of the project, not only just the devices that are extremely good, is that although there's some technology that can classify lesions, still this artificial intelligence that is gonna help us with the diagnosis is not fully developed. And many of the, of the systems in the world, they're using just some collections of images to create databases that may may not be good. We want to do it in real Australian population. So we are gonna invite and this, this week we're putting our purchase order for the three first of this, so it's a good day and we're really happy with this. So three of them are gonna come very soon. 
What we want is Australians with low, medium, and high risk to participate in the project, to get a scan that we look at all the lesions and that we follow them in depending on the risk. And, and, and CAS is here helping us with classifying risk of our pa patients or the, or the subjects in the study, who is going to be a low risk, a medium risk, a high risk, and then follow them getting every six months or every year or every two years and looking at those lesions and how they change. And whatever we remove, because we think that could be dangerous or could be a skin cancer or melanoma in this case, we're gonna review the histology too, to get the precise diagnosis. So our images is not just that we think could be a melanoma, is that we're gonna have as much positive uh, confirmation of that melanoma. All this is gonna be feeding to AI systems, artificial intelligence systems, and hopefully we will get an opportunity to diagnose, not locally, in, as I said, in, in Metro Sydney, but helping rural and remote Australians with early diagnosis of pigmented lesions that need to be removed. That's amazing, Pablo. And I think it's um, a you know, real example of what is life-changing. Um, medical research that's that's happening here at, at Westmead. And I think the advances in technology um, and the application of artificial intelligence to, to help us in terms of um, addressing melanoma is truly, truly exciting and a game changer. Mm. Yes, it's, it's going to be really good. We need to work hard for this. Yeah, totally. Yes, yes. And, and Westmead is leading the way too in developing non-invasive alternatives to biopsies. Um, why is this so important and what can you tell us about that? So this is the, the other thing. So you, you've got that, that image here. It's so good. You know, you, there's a lot of pigmented lesions. Some of them are bigger, some of them mm. are smaller. We know, because that's the statistics that we have now, that if a patient goes to a GP, we'll need to remove around 20 to 30 of these pigmented lesions to find out the one that is a melanoma. If it goes to a more specialist, like a dermatologist, they even sometimes struggle and because you don't want to miss something that could create a bad prognosis or kill a patient. The dermatologist will remove around eight to 10 lesions. And we know that when these patients and mainly the high risk patients, they come to our clinics, we're quite good, but still we remove three lesions to find one melanoma. So there's a lot of activity, a lot of surgery that we're still doing in patients and patients and Linda knows quite well and is describing that, that her sons, uh, her kids, they're getting surgery done. Well, it's good that at the end, the pathologists say that's fine. It's not a, a melanoma, but they're living with the scars and the scars could appear in any part or they could be done in any part of the body. And sometimes the scars, they're not that nice and sometimes could give problems. So the second technology that we are using is this one. And we are quite, quite happy on how the results they're going, but it's very early, and is tape stripping. We put a kind of a special tape, medical grade tape, put it on the skin, we rub it on top of the, of the pigmented lesion. We, do, we take five of these tapes, collect the proteins that we have in this, analyze, and the system can classify if those proteins are coming from a benign mole, a mole that could be a melanoma, or a mold that already is a melanoma. And it's very early, what I'm saying, we are really optimistic that this is gonna be happening in the future, but it's still there's a way in front of us. We, we have collected a number of lesions, we need to get more funding to now get into a validation of our technology. And of course, this could be the future. So once uh, with the imaging, we get a, a pigmented lesion that is a little bit funny, we could do this scarless biopsy find out that yes, this lesion needs to go or not, this lesion could stay because it's not, you know, it could be just follow with image. And I imagine that would transform the, the, the early diagnosis of melanomas significantly, um, which I guess brings us to the next point around, even with the advancements in, in diagnostics, pursuing the most appropriate treatment as quickly as possible um, can quite literally be a matter of, of, of life, life or death. Um, and we know that in you know, delaying treatment of a stage one melanoma by just one month increases the risk of death by 5%, which I find you know, astounding. And after four months, 
and I think that's 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 a really scary statistic. So you know these statistics I think really are deeply concerning, but they also speak to why research like what you you and your team are conducting at at at, at Wimmer Pablo, um, and particularly with the precision medicine focus, is so incredibly valuable. Yes, it's, it's really important that we detect these patients as soon as possible. Mm. It's extremely important and then we classify them as you're saying, precision medicine. And for that, we need more biomarkers. And that's another area that we're working. We're trying to find markers, genetic markers, protein markers that will help us to classify what are the patients that are going to evolve into more aggressive tumors and we need to intervene early. And those that they're going to respond to treatment so we can commence with the treatment as soon as possible. So these are our important research projects that we're carrying out at Wimmer. Mm. And what can you tell us about immunotherapies and how they're improving patient outcomes? Immunotherapies has been a game changer for us, completely a game changer. From the old times that we, as I said, we didn't have really fantastic treatments, now we using this stimulating of the immune system, but they do, and it's an interesting mechanism. So melanoma cells, they disguise themselves as benign cells because they look benign, the immune system cannot attack them. So this immunotherapy is what they do is that they remove what it looks, the, the good face of the melanoma cells mm -hmm. and disclose the the dangerous, ugly thing that is behind, mm -hmm. and then the immune system can attack that. Mm -hmm. So this commenced just not even 10 years ago with the mm -hmm. basic research, and now they've been approved. We have in Australia approved treatments with immunotherapies, and that's changing the life of our patients. That's really changing the life of our patients. Expensive treatments that we, as I said, even with these amazing treatments, one in two patients with a stage four melanoma is gonna die in five years. So we need to do more, we need to get mm -hmm. better, we need to improve that outcome, but has changed the life of many melanoma mm -hmm. patients like Linda that has received these immune therapies mm -hmm. and now has a new life. Mm -hmm. Fabulous, thank you, thank you Pablo. And, and, and now, and I'd like to um, you know, focus on a point that we were um, touching on earlier uh, in terms of the research indicating that young people um, take the greatest number of risks and use the least amount of protection in, in the sun. Um, and, you know, this, as we said, is the generation that was raised on, on, on sun safe messaging. Um, what do you think we can do to improve messaging and achieve real behavioural change within this group? Yeah, thanks, Katrina. We know, we know that mass media campaigns like um, depending on how old you are, if you remember Sid the Seagull and the, the whole Sip Sop Slap type campaigns, that they're really important for shifting behaviours and culture at a population level. And uh, if, if we take our foot off the pedal in terms of those mass media campaigns, then people tend to slip back into the old behaviours. So, so there is a place for yeah, mass media campaigns reminding people to slop, slap, sleep, seek, slide. So uh, on top of that, we also need to uh, protect the particularly vulnerable populations. So they are, you know, young people, people that work outdoors. Uh, so primary schools are particularly good at having some smart um, policies at the school level. Uh, for example, no hat, no play. But as we've heard from Linda, once you get to adolescence, you know, there's still a real lack of um, effective interventions for, for teenagers. Um, and I think the, her, uh, Linda's point about the fashion um, is important. I mean, I think that is definitely one way we can um, try to improve sun safe behaviours is to, is to make it fashionable to, to wear uh, sun safe clothing and to sit shade and uh, some of the mass media campaigns have been targeted around changing uh, the desire for a tan so if you go to Europe it's it's still very desirable to have a tan I think it's less so in Australia now compared to 20 years ago but it's still you know it's still around but um, changing ad uh, attitudes towards tanning uh, is something you know we can try and do 
Um, and then, yeah, making sure that uh, sunscreen is affordable and that uh, work safe policies, uh, you know, are in place for people who work outdoors and, and, and things like that. I think they're all really, really important um, points that you've that you've raised, Anne. Thank you. And um, I guess for those people who um, who have been unfortunate enough to to develop skin cancer, um, you know, I think patient education obviously then becomes very, very important. Um, what can you tell us about Westmead's tailored surveillance program? Yeah. So one of my areas of interest is around better identifying people at high risk and making sure that their their management is appropriate to their level of risk. So we have been developing a suite of risk tools, uh, including a, a risk tool uh, to help predict whether your risk of getting a first melanoma. And then for people who've already had a melanoma, their risk of getting another melanoma. So we're trying to use these risk tools to help tailor uh, how often people should come into the clinic for a skin check, um, you know, before, if they've never had a melanoma, but if they have had a melanoma, should they be coming back every four months, every six months, every year? And we're trying to uh, use these risk prediction tools to help guide uh, that, in, that decision and also to find out whether giving better information to people about their personal risk and um, prevention, tailored prevention and skin self-examination advice, whether that, um, whether that helps people in terms of their uh, psychological health and, and their ability to check their own skin and their prevention behaviours. So we're doing um, a suite of research around this and hopefully the information we gather through the research project will actually help uh, guide you know, what, what happens Australia-wide in terms of mm -hmm. guidelines for, for how often people should get a skin check and, and yeah, the tailoring that prevention advice according to people's risk. Yeah, that's, that's great. Thank you, Anne. Um, we have got a couple of questions that have come in through the audience, so um, we'll, uh, we'll address those um, in, in, in a second. Um, but before we do that, um, just wanted to um, uh, touch on, you know, obviously many people tonight may be thinking um, you know, what can I do to, to get involved in, in the wonderful work that Pablo and, 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 and team are doing? Um, and more broadly, what can I do to support the research work that is um, in progress at, at WIMA? So I just wanted to give you a couple of ideas um, in terms of how you might um, extend your support. Um, obviously, it would be fabulous if, um, if, you, um, if something that you've heard tonight has really resonated with you, you've liked what you've heard, you found it valuable, it would be fabulous if you could um, share um, that messaging um, as, as far and as broad as you can amongst your family, friends and, and, and colleagues. And obviously social media is a fantastic way to do that. Um, if you're not already following um, our social media handles, I would encourage you to, to do so. Um, we regularly share content and um, it would be wonderful if you could um, follow us on social media um, and once again engage and, and, and share content that you see um, relevant. We do have a number of events that, that take place um, throughout throughout the year. Obviously COVID um, changed the way that we conduct our events um, pre-COVID. We, we would of course love to have invited you all into, um, into WIMA to, to meet with us face to face um, and we hope to be able to resume that program in 2021. Uh, but we will have um, online events that will continue into 2021. So please stay informed as to what we're doing. Um, you're able to, um, to go onto our website. We have a fabulous um, magazine called Discovery um, that you can um, register to, to receive. So I'd encourage you to do that. And of course, um, if you have the capacity, we would encourage you to, um, to make a donation um, to, to support the wonderful work being done here. So it's possible to go online um, and donate online, or please do feel free to, to call uh, Wimmer and uh, myself and my team will be, you know, really happy to, to, to speak with you. Um, so I think now it's a great time to, to, to go to some questions. And we've had a couple of really interesting ones that have come through from the audience. Um, so one of them is, how has the increase in tattooing impacted the mapping of moles? 
it affects and undeniable. We need to look at the skin. It's not just machines. It's human yes. side also that gets affected. And sometimes they use funny colors. And for that makes us even more difficult. Putting pigment inside the skin means that some of the molds, they disappear. We don't see them anymore. So we can miss them. Mm -hmm. And some others, they put the colors that are gonna, that are more linked to risk. Could be more blue, could be could be red, and we get more anxious. So it's, it's a problem. And then, of course, you, as a doctor, you recommend to do a biopsy and destroy a beautiful tattoo. So it yeah. has a lot of implications. So certainly we're not happy. It's not that we say to people don't get tattoos. That's a very personal question. From the dermatology point of view, there's some risk in tattooing, mm -hmm. apart from hiding hiding molds, there's, there's reactions to pigment, there, there's scarring, there are a few things that could happen to some people. Globally, they're quite safe if it's done in a proper uh, certified facility. Otherwise, even infections could be another risk. But yes, it's half an impact, half an impact in how we can review yeah. and diagnose melanoma. Yeah, interesting. And, and another question that's come through is, um, what about if I don't have any molds? Should I still have my skin checked? Is it still relevant? Well, Anne could tell you about risk. From the dermatology point of view, if there's nothing on the skin, there's nothing on the skin. We can do very little. Yes. Yeah. But certainly what is education and other parts of the of the discussion could happen. But Anne may mm -hmm. have some other things. Yeah. Well, moles are one of the risk factors. It's not the only risk factor. And it is quite a strong risk factor. So if you've got a lot of moles, it does reflect both a genetic susceptibility as well as probably uh, you also get moles from spending time in the sun. So if you, if you have a lot of moles, it might also reflect that you've had a lot of sun exposure. Mm. But um, not all melanomas develop from a mole. Uh, you can, if so uh, some melanomas, um, about half of melanomas, I think, uh, develop from where there was no mole previously. So if you notice a new spot or... Uh, you know, a change in your skin, you should definitely get it checked out. But there's multiple risk factors for melanoma and, and you might have no moles, but you might have red hair and freckles and very fair skin. Uh, typically, those people may, may not have a lot of moles, but they're still high risk. Or you might have a family history of, of melanoma. So I think, you know, you need to be aware of other risk factors. And, and we heard, you know, Thank you again, Linda. We heard Linda's story um, and she shared with us that she was diagnosed at, at, at the age of at 12. Um, and I'm sure that many of us, uh, you know, on, on, on the call this evening have, have young children. Another question that's come through is, at what age should I begin um, having my skin checked? What, what, is, is there ever an age that's too young to have your skin checked? No, there's never an age too young. Yeah. Every every mole should be looked at least once. Mm. That's that would be a recommendation. Mm. And if they they gone through and, and dermatologists and everything is okay, then is when we use the famous E in the A B C D E mm. that is change. And as Anne was describing, you've got a change, you've got a new mold, you've got a new pigmented lesion that need to be looked at. Mm. And if a kid comes, we review. If the moles are good, from that that time onwards we just look for changes and most they do change so that's that's i'm not going to deny that until we're 18 20 they change all the time so many of the changes are going to be okay and there's no yes. really high risk but yep yeah, melanoma happens in young kids and linda yeah. is an example of of a young patient having melanoma okay um now another question's come through um i'm a 65 year old and I've had hundreds of pre-malignant um, moles taken off over the years. What does this mean for my risk factor? Yeah, it sounds like they've had precursors of skin cancers um, taken off, perhaps actinic keratoses and things. I think to me that suggests that, um, that you have um, evidence of sun damaged skin and, and that is a risk factor for melanoma because it indicates that you may have had um, a lot of sun exposure. Do you have anything to add, Pablo? 
I think that what you have summarized is just the, the deal in this case, having pre-malignant lesions talk about long-term exposure to the sun. And that's of course, increases your risk factor. And if you're developing pre-malignant lesions, probably the skin color would be quite light. And we know that, and we can even predict that the eyes will be blue or green. Mm. So it would be light color too. Mm. And, Which and brings us to another question. Sorry, Anne. Oh, I was just going to say, definitely, if you've had other types of skin cancer, like BCCs and SCCs, they're definitely a risk factor for getting a melanoma. Yeah. Um, it brings us to another question. Um, uh, one of the audience members has asked if we could talk a little bit about um, different ethnicities um, and the risks for different um, ethnic groups. Uh, and if you have mixed heritage, does it change your vulnerability? Yes, yes, your, your ethnic background does influence your risk. And uh, that's part of the problem in Australia that we've, we've um, most people have come from a, a European background, um, particularly in the UK where fair skin uh, people planted in Australia with very high UV levels doesn't sort of go hand in hand. Um, Pablo has lovely Spanish skin. He, he, he's probably lower risk than me uh, because of his ethnic background. Uh, but, but still living in Australia with such high UV levels, I mean, everyone is at risk, I think, in Australia just because of the, such a strong um, uh, exposure to UV. But, um, but yeah, your ethnic background, if you have a darker skin colour, you'll be um, a little bit more protected. Do you want to add anything to that, Pablo? Yes, the, the, the other interesting bit is, of course, the skin colour is one of the, the main factors to be more, have more protection or less, as you're mm -hmm. hearing. Another important factor is that people with darker skin, they could develop melanoma also. And interestingly, it's not that they develop as many melanomas on sun exposed areas, they could develop melanomas on on soles, on palms, acral areas, that could explain that some cases melanoma could be triggered by trauma or some other factors, mm -hmm. because even and that's another research done by um, in Wimmer in collaboration mm -hmm. with MIA, with the Melanoma Institute of Australia, the genetics of these acral melanomas, they're different mm -hmm. from the melanomas that appear on the body. And we find an excess, but probably it's because they have very little on the body in people with really dark skin colors. They have more melanoma, some palms and soles. So, so yes, we always yeah. look for those. Yeah. Yes, and, and 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 is it correct, Pablo, that you know perhaps or Anne, um, is it correct that um, you know a melanoma may appear in uh, a part of the body that's not necessarily been exposed to the sun? So you know it might be that it you know appears on on the soles of our feet, for instance. Yeah. So it's it's less frequent. It's very low frequency, but we know that melanocytes could. And melanoma could appear on the eye, could appear in the mm. mouth. So there are mucosal mm. melanomas, eye melanomas, rarely inside the body, but there's a small chance. Most mm. of them, and the biggest amount is just on sun exposed skin. So even though we're talking about the rare or the really rare melanomas, everybody has to understand that being exposed mm. to the sun, getting the skin exposed to the sun is the main risk mm. factor, but there's melanomas that appear in cover areas too. Okay. And um, Bob, Bob Marley famously got one of these melanomas and died from a melanoma on the on the foot. On mm. the foot, yes. Mm. Very interesting. Um, so we've got time for one final question. Um, I'm just mindful of, of our time this evening. Um, and that is, in terms of a sunscreen, um, what should I look for? Um, is there any, are there any tips you can provide in terms of directing us towards the best type of sunscreen yes. to go with? There's two, two important things. One is SPF, so the factor, and the other is the amount. And SPF is important thing. As soon as you've got fair skin, you should look for the highest. The highest approved in Australia is a 50 plus. And most people with really wide skin should be using a 50 plus. Mm. That reduces chances of, uh, of melanoma and skin cancer and photoaging. Some people, they don't do it because of cancer. They do it because they want to look down. So yeah. if you want to look down your whole life, use an SPF 50 plus 
every day, at least on the face. So that's one thing. If you were to be dark skinned, you could discuss with your dermatologist, but sometimes we could recommend a 30, maybe a 15. It's, it's difficult. We always will prefer the highest possible. But yes, some, some skin types could use a lower SPF. The second important point, and this is critical, is the amount of cream that we put on the skin. We see many issues with sunscreens just because people tend to use very little. And what most, not even, I was going to say, not even doctors, they, they understand is that to cover the whole skin with a proper amount of sunscreen, you will need between 30 and 60 grams or 30 and 60 milliliters. So that means that that bottle that you buy of half a liter of sunscreen that look like a lot, well, it's only 10 times that you apply that on the whole body. And if that bottle lasts for a whole summer, probably you're not putting enough. And that's what people, they need to understand. It's not only just the SPF, it's also that we need to put the right amount of the cream. Mm. And for sure, if you're streaming, putting things on, putting things off, that sunscreen goes, which you need to reapply. So be mindful about the amount of sunscreen and always look for a high SPF. Yeah, and I might just add to that, um, the cancer, cancer Council often says, the best sunscreen is the sunscreen that you'll, uh, that you'll apply. So some people avoid sunscreens because they don't like the feel of them. So, you know, I would say if you ideally a 50 plus sunscreen, but if you can't find one that you like, then go for a, a 30 plus, you know, that you'll actually apply. That's better than, than not using one at all. So uh, absolutely, yeah, something great. is better than nothing. Yes, yes. yes. Yeah. No, that's good. Well, look, I'm just really mindful of, of, of time um, because we're due to wrap up at, at, at 7.30. So look, I'd, I'd really like to, um, to thank everyone again for, for joining us this evening. Uh, it's been truly fabulous to, to have your company. And I do hope that you know, you've, you've um, learned something new this evening. And as I said, if you have learned something new, um, please, we'd love for you to share it um, broadly with your family, friends, colleagues, um, and do make contact with us if you've got any uh, questions um, or comments or things that you'd like to discuss following, following the session tonight. I'd like to give an enormous thank you to Pablo and, and Linda in particular for, for joining us this evening. Um, thank you for, for giving us your time um, and sharing your wisdom. Um, it's really, really much appreciated. Thank you. So as a leading uh, Australian Medical Research Institute, WIMA, as I said earlier, is focused on making the world a better place for all of us. Uh, for our children and our, and, our, and our grandchildren, which I think is the, the really exciting thing. It's, it's, a, it's about giving hope through medical research for a better life um, for current and, and future generations. And this year, if we have learned anything, it's that good health can never be taken for granted. Uh, and it really does shape the quality of, of our lives. Uh, and I think medical research um, holds the key to addressing many of, of the very serious health issues facing us today. So to deliver successful health outcomes, it requires investment and support. And we're really reliant upon continued support. You making the time to be with us this evening um, is fabulous. And obviously, if, as I said, you do have the capacity to give um, so that we can continue to, to deliver our groundbreaking research, that would be very, very much welcomed and, and appreciated. Uh, so I encourage you, as I said, to, to, to spread the message far and wide. Please do connect with us on social media. Uh, go onto the website um, and, and have a look at the information that we have there. And if you would like to talk with, with any of the team, I'd encourage you to, to, to call us. Um, we can be reached on 02 8627 3000. That's 02 8627 3000. Um, so we'd, we'd really love to hear from, from anyone and everyone who's, who's interested in our work. So I think that's enough from us for, for this evening. Um, a link to a survey will be sent to you tomorrow. Um, and we'd really love if you could just take a few moments to, to, um, to fill that in for us. Your feedback is really invaluable. We obviously want to make these sessions as relevant and informative and as useful um, for, for, for you as we possibly can. So your feedback really, um, really would be truly appreciated. So I'd like to wrap up now um, and I wish you and your families 
a health and healthy and happy uh, Christmas and look forward to seeing you once again uh, when we resume our Meet the Researcher in 2021. So all the very best for the festive season and here's to a fabulous 2021. Thank you again for joining us this evening. Thank you. Thank you.